Okay, so civil rights, putting our rights uh, into practice. Now, as we know, we have certain inalienable rights, uh, certain rights that uh, we have under the Bill of Rights to practice, such as uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, freedom of petition. Very important. And it's very important, particularly at a time like this in an election, because you have the right to pretty much say whatever you want, advocate for whatever a candidate you want, as long as it's done peace. All these uh, political ads you see on these different TV stations, radio stations, um, online, uh, uh, it is federal law that you cannot deny. Uh, fair broadcast outlet, you cannot deny someone um, a political ad. You can't, um, you can't say, well, I don't like your politics, I'm not going to public, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to run it. No, you have to. Do you agree with it or not? That is uh, FCC guidelines. Now, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, he got in some trouble recently. Uh, they have a big, uh, Abortion Rights Amendment on the ballot in Florida. Um, and uh, there was this one TV station in Florida who was running some ads from this uh, uh, group that's favoring favoring passage of this amendment. DeSantis tried to tell his TV station uh, uh, not, to, not to run it or they'll get arrested. FCC uh, sent a uh, strong letter saying, you can't do that. That TV station can run, uh, can have the right to run that ad. You do not have the right to interfere. That's the way it is. You have to permit um, opposing viewpoints on podcast stations. Um, if they do, just have to buy an ad for it. But the other... Um, uh, civil rights liberties include uh, no unreasonable searches and seizures, as, um, standards for search warrants. Um, that by a grand jury, no double jeopardy, no self-incrimination, um, due process of law, speedy and public trial, jury and trial in civil cases, no excessive bail or fines, no cruel and unusual punishments. Now, of course, there have been a lot of instances in American history where these basic rights were to like the right to vote, um, freedom of speech, and so forth. That's where the 14th Amendment came out. Ratified in 1868. Which, among other provisions, and there are several others here, but includes, among other things, that uh, all citizens have equal rights. And anyone born in the United States uh, is a United States citizen. Regardless of the citizenship status of their parents. And even if you're naturalized, this process of becoming a citizen, once you become a citizen, you always uh, have the full rights and privileges of everyone else. As they decided after the Civil War that above all that war meant and the entire uh, and the very principles of the Bill of Rights and the Constitution meant that we must be equal under law. There can be no special privileges or restrictions, equality under law. But there are still a lot of groups who had very limited rights or few rights at all. Um, women still had very few rights. Women couldn't vote in 1868. Uh, they couldn't vote nationwide until 1920. 
a lot of states put limits on uh, the rights of African Americans, particularly in the 1880s and 1890s, basically severely limiting their right to vote. Um, women couldn't serve on juries in a lot of states till the late 1950s and 1960s. Mississippi being the last state to allow women to serve on a jury, and that was in 1968. I talked about all his movies last time, the, uh, one of them being 12 Angry Men, famous movie from 1957. Had a jury, but it's 12 men. Because in that state, in a lot of states, women weren't serving on juries yet. Even then, there are questions about uh, basic sexuality under law, uh, the rights of uh, gays and lesbians. So gay marriage wasn't legal in the United States until 2005. I mean, 2015. Um, I'd say it into the 1990s. You can be fired from a job based on your sexual orientation, things you were not even doing on the uh, uh, in the work time or on your uh, work premises. But so much of American history and American political rights, these discussions over our basic rights, involve the question of race. Africans were imported to the United States to the uh, New World by the millions, um, and they were treated as property under law. And even once they were freed, the freedmen had severely limited rights. There were a lot of people trying to turn back the clock and enforce slavery in a new way, a kind of slavery. And then you had the birth of what came called the Jim Crow laws. Now, Jim Crow law, that is any law uh, meant to uh, uh, restrict and impose segregation, restrict voting rights, voting power, and enforce a system of white supremacy. Ultimately, goes the goal is white supremacy. And these laws are mostly in the South, but you can find some of them in the North. mostly passed in the 1860s into the early 1900s. But among the most uh, common component here was segregation. Segregation that has attempted to separate race uh, uh, citizens on the basis of race. It meant pretty much any, anywhere in public. Schools, hospitals, buses, um, <coughs> trains, um, restaurants, um, hotels. I said so many people had to, uh, with the humiliation of seeing signs read, whites only. Whites only as well, it's only that. Um, people, uh, Good, honest people who are uh, just uh, uh, looking to take their families out to eat at a restaurant or uh, just looking for medical care and told they weren't welcome there. And segregation meant that, that was the law. Now, there are uh, Fountains uh, for segregated whites only, those for non-whites. Bathrooms, those for whites, non-whites. Some states, uh, like Mississippi and uh, Georgia, witnesses being sworn into court, swear to oath to God, you're going to tell the truth in a trial. They're sworn in on separate Bibles. 
the white black would even touch. So I've had a lot of students, I've had uh, uh, they, uh, they and the parents and things like that, that uh, there's one student telling me that uh, her parents, uh, African-American woman, her parents would not stop anywhere while they were out. Go to the store, straight to the store, straight home. Go visit a friend, uh, a relative, come straight back home. Would not let them stop to uh, go to the bathroom or anything because um, didn't want to have to see the uh, whites only signs. They'd never eat in a restaurant because uh, one thing these restaurants wouldn't serve them, but uh, just they just pick up something in the back. But we didn't get out of the car. He mentioned why they were having to do that. So we'd just rather go home. My grandmother, her first job was as a waitress in uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, in 1940. She's 13 years old, and uh, one thing that really struck her was. Uh, one day they had uh, these two customers come by. Uh, one's this uh, big fat white guy who uh, came in, uh, sat down, spitting on the floor, cussing, screaming. Um, and the other was this uh, elderly African American gentleman. Came up in his, he was a train porter. Came up in his uniform, very polite, uh, very dignified, very professional dress. Just uh, asked if he could uh, get something to eat. Um, just wanted to pay for it and everything, uh, obviously. And, um, well, because of the segregation laws, it allowed them up the front, but decided, you know, we'll, uh, we'll set you up some nice little spot here in the back. Nice tablecloth, a little seat there, just uh, we sat and he, uh, had, a, uh, had his lunch. Um, my grandmother was just really annoyed by that. Here's this nice, polite man who couldn't be served because of the law. But that fat, nasty man up, up front, cussing and spitting on the floor, had uh, could be served. I've had uh, African American students tell me how they grew up right across the street from a city park. They grew up in uh, Sulphur Springs, Texas. This is not just Texas; it's all over the South. It's a beautiful playground across the street see it, uh, all the playground equipment and everything, couldn't go to it. Why? Segregated park. The park that his parents paid for with their tax dollars, he could not go to. But maybe on one or two days of a year, the city might let uh, uh, only blacks go there that one day. A lot of state fairs are like that. Uh, whites only most days, but might have one or two days it was for a uh, um, African Americans. Schools are segregated. Um, well, it's now Washington Middle School across town here. That was the segregated uh, black high school up until the 1960s. Um, the Carver Elementary School across from First Baptist on Cordell Street, that was a segregated elementary school. It's an African American history museum. Landmarks here and there. But there really are two types of segregation de facto and de jure. Latin terms de facto means by fact, de jure by law. Segregation in the South was de jure, uh, segregation de jure uh, by law. Forced by law, criminal statutes. But in the North, you have a lot of areas that's de facto segregation. Segregation by fact. Um, that there were just certain neighborhoods that um, whites, and neighbor, whites and blacks would live in that the two would not mix together. Now, there are several cases like Chicago that a black family tried to move into a white neighborhood and uh, uh, the neighbors get a collection together, buy them out, keep them from coming into the neighborhood, or would um, um, cause a deer ride on their lawn, try to force them out of, out of their homes, and a lot of times that worked. 
Um, that latest novel called White Flight, that once a black family started moving into a neighborhood, black families would start leaving as quickly as they could. The segregation was not, not the law in New York or Chicago, but somebody existed by fact. So, his famous civil rights actor was a comedian named Dick Gregory, who was popular in the 1960s and 70s, once explained the difference between racism between the North and the South. He said, uh, in the South, they don't care how, the North, they don't care, care how big you get, as long as you don't get too close. They don't care how big you get, as long as you don't get too close. In the South, they don't care how close you get, as long as you don't get too big. Explain the difference here. In the North, is more the two would stay separate. Um, African Americans, uh, other uh, minorities, got freed, uh, not largely, um, say, had no restrictions, but uh, no one really minded if uh, African Americans or uh, whites, never really minded if uh, African Americans or other minorities became successful. Um, as long as uh, they stayed away from each other. But in the South, it was a matter of position. That uh, um, African Americans and other minorities are also always supposed to be subservient. That is, they don't care how close you get, that is, African Americans usually working for a white man or white woman in an employee employer relationship. Aid, housekeeper, um, gardener, whatever else. Employee, employer, employee relationship. One is always above the other. You ever see that old movie, The Help? That really kind of touches on it. Uh, story about these African American maids in uh, um, Jackson, Mississippi in the late 50s and early 60s. Really good movie. A really good book, too. Now, de facto segregation was enforced in some ways by a, a call, is called redlining. That is, banks would uh, draw a big red line on a map and uh, not loan to African Americans or other minority groups to buy property uh, in certain parts of the city, in certain neighborhoods. Is enforcing uh, through a discrimination loan making process, um, making sure that um, making sure that the races would not uh, that uh, the uh, neighborhoods would not start mixing racially. And redlining actually was. Uh, legal until uh, 1968 until the Fair Housing Act. Look at that in a minute. Uh, then it got desegregation. Mostly initiated by the Brown versus Board Education case in 1954. This is mostly the focus in the 1950s and 1960s. Simply the process of ending segregation, allowing a handful of minority children to uh, attend a mostly white school. And every state across the South, there was a, a lawsuit over um, a desegregation. A lot of school districts, including districts here across Arkansas, um, across Union County, they still under are under federal court orders regarding desegregation and integration, uh, making sure that desegregation is not practiced at all. Because it took this case, Brown versus Board of Education, to start enforcing the Fourteenth Amendment, saying that segregation is inherently unconstitutional. You cannot. Uh, Separate the uh, label and separate people by race. 
segregation. Why do they have the like other laws to that to where like that? Why do they still have these federal court orders in place? Yeah. yeah. Because there are a lot of people who do everything they could to undo all this. Racism didn't disappear. It just became impolite. In Texas, interestingly enough, you have a large Hispanic population. So you had three way segregation. You had schools for whites, schools for Hispanics, and schools for African Americans. The thing is, all this... Uh, multiple buildings and uh, redundant staff, uh, it weighed down schools in the South. Schools were actually falling further and further behind the North and they didn't necessarily practice segregation. But there were some states that practiced uh, different kinds of segregation, like uh, California for a while had uh, segregated uh, whites from Asians, uh, people coming from Japan and China coming to the West Coast. Um, and then you have integration. This is the focus in the 1970s and 1980s. Now, integration did, does, is, tries to bring together. For example, Suppose you've got a community that is, let's just say, for the sake of supposing, uh, one third white, one third black, one third Hispanic. Now, if there is no uh, discrimination in housing or employment, um, every neighborhood and every business be roughly one third white, one third black, one third Hispanic, give or take a few percent. But because of housing discrimination, because of employment discrimination, minority communities usually were poorer than white communities. There were a lot of poor whites, but a uh, uh, larger number, percentage were poor. And um, they lived in segregated neighborhoods, segregated by fact or by law. So it meant that these schools that came up in these segregated areas, they were serving mostly black or Hispanic neighborhoods. So without uh, racism, uh, all the schools in that community, or a hypothetical community, would be one-third white, one-third black, one-third Hispanic. But I said what you saw in a lot of communities was school, for schools that were like 99% white, 99% black, 99% Hispanic were not representative of the community. So the effort in the 1970s, 1980s was to try to make these schools more representative of uh, their communities they were serving. Because after years, because uh, even though under segregation, the idea was separate but equal, equality was never practiced. Minority schools always had less of everything. Teachers were paid less. Equipment was always worse. School for maintenance was not as much a priority. The books that minority children might get in these uh, segregated schools might be the 10 year old hand me down books from the white school. All ripped, up, ripped and torn up. So the idea in a lot of these communities was something they called busing. They basically start taking kids, start putting them in these other schools, try to uh, force the community to integrate, the schools to integrate, bring African Americans to uh, children to uh, white schools, bring white children to African American schools, and so forth. And how did this go over in these neighbor a lot of these neighborhoods? Not well. 1974, South Boston. Um, Series of riots erupted when they tended to uh, the school district tended to bus in African American students from another uh, neighborhood into a all white neighborhood. People are screaming, protesting, hitting uh, these students, throwing things at them. Got to remember, 
They suggest children here. They're assaulting children over uh, the idea that they weren't, uh, they were a different color, didn't want them in their uh, schools. The place had to bust these riots up uh, in 1974, and the same thing again in 1975. What happened over the years was in South Boston that more and more whites started moving out of the, out of the city and uh, uh, more minorities started moving in. So by 1999, busing was ended because some of this, uh, uh, because integration had largely been achieved. And you'll see this in a lot of southern communities too that would call the white flight communities, whites leaving communities to try to uh, go to here try to avoid busing and uh, segregation and integration. Um, you see this a lot of uh, schools in West Little Rock and some of the surrounding suburbs. Those were uh, okay, white flag communities, especially in Dallas and Houston. Um, Plano, Richardson, um, those were all tiny little farm towns in 1950 because that put after it segregation and integration came in, the city population has just exploded. Today, uh, Plano would have been a city of like 2,500 people in the 1950s, like a city of about 300,000 now. Um, see somewhere in uh, uh, Houston and so forth. This was a Controversial program called Affirmative Action. Also called Equal Opportunities. The attempt to try to encourage employers to hire more uh, minorities and women uh, to take uh, into account that, uh, uh, take a deeper look at their qualifications. Um, uh, and life experiences when hiring rather than just simply hiring on the basis of race. Well, a lot of people, uh, a lot of whites got upset about this, um, saying that uh, it was discriminating against them. So particularly in uh, California, the state universities want to make sure that uh, Want to work very hard to make sure that uh, school uh, college populations were roughly represented with the population of California. So encouraging the uh, st uh, universities to admit uh, extra students from uh, minority neighborhoods and minority mostly minority schools. Plus, one guy got upset about this, and it ended up denying him an opportunity to even attend. Because apparently he just barely missed the cutoff. That led to the case California versus Bakke in 1978. Um, they said that there, there could be no racial quota system for admissions to uh, universities. But there are important legislation in, uh, enforcing civil rights uh, legislation. Three biggest from uh, the 1960s were the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of being the Housing Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Civil Rights Act of 1964 bans discrimination in uh, housing, voting, um, employment, education, uh, promotions, and wages.
and said he cannot discriminate on the basis of uh, sex, uh, race, color, uh, uh, religious, uh, religious affiliation, or national uh, origin. For example, you have um, I'm going to hire somebody. You can't reject the job, reject someone for the job because they're born in a different country. I can't make the choice based on whether they're a man or a woman or not, or whether they're black or white or not. So no discrimination on uh, these bases. Women uh, until 1963 until the Equal Pay Act. Women were, could be paid less than man, a man for the same job. They ended that in the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Uh, okay, the federal government more control, more strength to prosecute that. But the problem was that a lot of employers kind of ended up changing uh, job titles, uh, job descriptions to uh, kind of hide the fact that maybe playing women or minorities less. Gap has been closing. There's been some additional legislation since then, but it's still an issue. So this act here, the Civil Rights Act, basically ends the Jim Crow system. You cannot have segregation. You cannot have. Um, you cannot deny someone an education on the basis of race. Um, um, can't have segregated hospitals or hotels or anything. I can't have these whites only sign on the doors anymore. That was illegal. Now the voting rights, like, even though discrimination vo voting was illegal, um, this strengthened the 1964 Civil Rights Act because there are ways because they knew there are kind of limitations in this law, but they need to go a little bit further, kind of tighten up any ways we might use to try to um, get around it. No discrimination in voting, voter registration, represent, uh, more political representation. Among other things, um, no disfranchisement measures, such as literacy tests. Those are very common in states across the South. Couldn't have those anymore. Um, basically, uh, the state, you'd have to go to county clerk's office, you'd have to prove that you were able to read and write. Some states, you'd have to recite parts of the state constitution. In other states, they have to go even further and have to explain, do you understand what you just recited or what you just read? But it's the county clerk's discretion to decide whether or not they pass the test. In other words, even if you pass, you don't pass. Discrimination also causes people to not yeah, uh, there was an interesting study done for the Brown Board of Education a case. Um, a group of psychologists did some tests on African American children and noticed that uh, segregation had caused many minorities to have a very negative view of themselves. Um, uh, because of that, though, um, one thing schools uh, minorities were in were just simply not as good because they were not funded very well. Teachers weren't trained as well, weren't paid as well. Um, Mississippi uh, tried to fix that with what they called the st school equalization laws, trying to put a bunch of money to African American schools and raising pay for African American teachers, but the court said too little, too late. Let's But yes, uh, 
this I call to show that uh, that minorities in the United States tend to be under a lot more pressure under whites, under a lot more social pressure because they don't know uh, uh, if their rights are ever going to be enforced. They don't know what's going to come right around the corner for them. Um, they knew the base uh, minorities had to, a lot of minorities had to live with the idea that they're constantly being watched. They're constantly under a threat, and constantly uh, uh, potentially the next victim of, a, of an assault or lynching. And so if you're under a lot of pressure and society's trying to give you a bad self-image, then yes, you're probably not going to do very well in school can't learn when you're under a lot of stress and have a lot of anxiety. So all African Americans? No, but uh, notice there's enough of a pattern for African Americans, uh, Hispanics, Asians, and others. And even sometimes with women in schools, um, you know, that's the kind of phenomenon sometimes seen that uh, sometimes girls in schools will pretend not to be as smart in order not to uh, draw attention to themselves. But I say you're an American, got the same rights as everyone else, you go for it. You go for the top. But uh, Voting Rights Act, no discrimination and uh, voting, uh, voter registration, um, Make it a lot easier for uh, people to uh, register to vote, not just limiting it to certain times of year. Um, Making sure that uh, um, voting locations were in areas that were easily accessible to everyone. No poll taxes, even though those were already outlawed under the 24th Amendment. Uh, no poll taxes. And particularly with representation. The idea of a one man, one vote was made the law of this act. Which meant that the idea of one man, one vote, that legislative districts, congressional districts, city council districts, they were all roughly equal in a population. And they weren't drawn in a way to make sure that, um, that um, minority voices were not drowned out. So that's still uh, something to do today. Um, up until recent years, the Supreme Court's trying to kind of mess with that a little bit. But uh, the idea that a lot of states would have to uh, submit their uh, maps for their uh, represent state representative and congressional districts to federal to the federal government for approval, to make sure they weren't discriminating against minorities. That in a largely minority neighborhood, that a minority would have a reasonable chance of getting elected. So as a result of the Voting Rights Act, voter registration surged across the South for minority groups. I think it went from Mississippi like 5% in 1964 to 70% uh, by 1971. So you have the dramatic increases in states like Arkansas, um, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Louisiana, and so forth. And with that, you know, with these new measures in place, um, more minorities start steadily getting elected to office, particularly in the 1960s and early 1970s. In uh, 1972, the first African American elected to the state legislature in Arkansas was elected for the first time since Reconstruction, nearly 100 years, because of the Voting Rights Act, uh, represented from Pine Bluff. Finally, the Fair Housing Act. So it's right to make sure to close all the loopholes, even though discrimination in housing was illegal, that yes, people really were being denied uh, the right to buy a house even if they had cash on hand or being able to rent an apartment, simply because of their color, the race, or even if they're mixed race color, or something like that. Fair Housing Act. So guys, look further uh, on that. No discrimination in housing.
own purchases, lending, leasing, um, could be denied. Uh, could be denied a uh, an apartment or rental home uh, under a Fair Housing Act because of your race, color, creed, or sex. Um, there are a lot of women who, single women, who uh, couldn't uh, uh, find a place to live because the apartment complex wouldn't uh, rent to single women. Or uh, the guy wouldn't rent the house out to a single woman. Um, on the basis of uh, race or color or religion. All that ended the Fair Housing Act. In fact, because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, you can't even ask someone on a employment application, are you man or woman? What race are you? What's your age? Even They include that information on a separate uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission form, which is voluntary to fill out. But basically, companies uh, take this information and uh, send it up to the federal government to show that uh, they're making active efforts to try to recruit uh, women, minorities, and uh, um, this is other hiring rates. But it's just voluntary to fill out that form, and you can't look, and uh, when you're um, hiring somebody, you can't look at that form. The hiring committee can't look at that form. The Fair Housing Act, you know, a discrimination in lending. So redlining is illegal. Did you ever see these commercials about banks today about buying a home, come get a loan with us? That says equal housing lender at the end. Comes to the Fair Housing Act of 1968. I see a little symbol here in the corner. Um, It's all part of the idea to make sure that uh, that everyone in this country is treated equally in law. No one has any special privilege. Everyone is treated the same under the law. Now there have been some modifications of these uh, uh, since then. Uh, you got the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. And all these, uh, the Civil Rights Act here and the Elementary Edu Secondary Education Act, uh, all under President Lyndon Johnson. But among other things, uh, I'm also giving a lot of a, uh, a federal aid to uh, colleges and uh, public schools, was did more to try to make sure that uh, um, schools were open to everyone. There wouldn't be any discrimination or segregation. Um, and even once integration uh, had been achieved, make sure that no one's being treated unequally. Um, for example, in the syllabus, we have to put, uh, we put in that statement saying um, the college does not uh, engage in or condone a discrimination on the basis of race, color, or sex, creed, national origin. As, a, as uh, our way of showing that we are upholding uh, our responsibilities of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And we have uh, routines and uh, procedures in place if discrimination does take place. So if you think you are being discriminated against, yes, go see the uh, provost of the Student Services Office and uh, we'll go to bat for you. We'll make sure it's fixed. But uh, 1972, you've got a couple of other things coming in. Uh, Title Seven and Title Nine. You see these emails here every so often. Uh, Title Seven, I uh, said, uh, no discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, and jobs. They're going to be hiring, uh, salary, and promotions. Also, some other things, no retaliation. 
if you report this uh, discrimination, no one's going to come after you for it. No hostile environments, it is. You don't have a hostile environment. Uh, no one's openly hostile to you on the basis of sex, race, or color. Um, you don't have people telling these nasty racist jokes in front of uh, in front of people. Um, you don't have uh, this is a very common case in the 1980s. Uh, women would start uh, working these places, and they have a lot of men hanging these pornographic uh, pictures all over the office. Uh, pornographic pictures. Um, the 1980s. There are a lot of uh, cases of. Uh, uh, women to go to work at a particular company or factory and be a lot of men hanging of uh, pornographic pictures of uh, women and that they that was considered a hostile environment you, you do that? Men to make them quit. yeah it's meant to try to make them quit or try to let them know that you have a certain position here and it's you're not one of us yeah. trying to exclude them from a group yeah so no hostile environment so something like that no you can't do that uh, no nasty comments. No, don't say any kind of racial slurs. Treat people with respect. It all comes down. Treat everyone with respect. No matter who they are, where they're from, what they look like. Um, and then that uh, just question is stick to the job. Do the job. Don't exclude anybody. Treat everyone the same. Um, equal treatment, equal rights. Respect. It all comes down to simple, basic respect. Yes, Title Seven. That's uh, mostly a, a jobs of the workplace. Title Nine has to do a lot with the education. Um, um, Title Seven applies mostly to women. Um, of course, I also found that it also applies to sexual orientation, that is, people, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, um, they have equal rights under the uh, under law based on Title VII. Title IX, basically, no sex discrimination, education, or educational attainment. Particularly um, comes the issue, you know, teachers can't date students. Um, it's not private, it's not professional, it's also not the law, but also, uh, uh, suppose you have a, a pregnant employee uh, or a pregnant student. This happens a lot. Um, give them every effort to try to maintain and continue their education, even if there is a disruption because of birth after a while. Uh, now, the very first college class I taught, I was 23 years old teaching a U.S. history course in McKinney, Texas. And uh, giving my spiel, got the syllabus out. It's a good day. I'm off to a good start. And this young oh, girl walks up to me, uh, maybe 18, 19 years old, and says, uh, uh, Professor Bridges, uh, I'm pregnant. My due date's the day of the first exam. Is that going to be a problem? No, we'll, we'll work around it. I told her, so don't worry about it. We did the best we could do for it. So, but not only was it just the right thing to do, but under Title IX, yes, I would need to give her uh, uh, time to get the te take the test and everything, and to uh, make sure that uh, birth isn't uh, disrupting her education. So that's part of that. Talk about the 24th Amendment. Um, <laughs> 1965 Voting Rights Act goes off of this, but uh, the 24th Amendment, um, no poll tax. You don't have to pay taxes to register to vote or to vote. It's in 1964. The Equal Pay Act of 1963. Cannot pay differently on the basis of uh, uh, race or sex. And uh, you have this huge wave 
of important civil rights legislation from 1963 and 1972, especially by the mid-1960s. As far as buildup of court cases and protests and political pressures, the, the dam burst. You have the right people in office at the right time. They start passing this legislation that completely transforms American society, it transforms America, uh, places of education and the workplace. That discrimination is at an end. That it will no. Um, that discrimination has no place in this country. That just treat people with decency and respect. It's not that hard to do. It doesn't matter what you were taught for so many years, what the tradition was for so many years. You know what? You treat people with respect. It's all it comes down to. Um, Equal Rights Amendment. So, Women's Rights Act has been pushing this since uh, the 1920s, but it finally passes Congress in 1972. Remember the amendment process? Two thirds of both houses have to agree, three quarters of the states have to ratify. Well, two thirds of the houses agreed, uh, two thirds of the houses agreed, and uh, it's sent to the states for ratification. What it says is there should be no discrimination on the basis of sex. And you might think, okay, Civil Rights Act, uh, shouldn't that cover it? Shouldn't the 14th Amendment cover that? Well, the problem was for 100 years, it didn't. Um, up till the early 1970s, married women had to get the permission of their husband to get a credit card even if they're the ones making all the money. A lot of states, women couldn't even get a uh, bank account without their husband's permission. Like I said, it was just a few years before this, a lot of states still wouldn't let women serve on juries. Until 1978, it was the law uh, women could be fired for being pregnant. 1978, federal law said women cannot be fired on basis of pregnancy. Um, the sexual harassment in the workplace. Most of the court cases in the 1980s said, uh, and the uh, um, various uh, civil rights amendments said, no, that is uh, that is illegal. And there are a lot of schools that wouldn't admit women in the 1970s. Um, Texas A&M University until the 1960s, they wouldn't admit women because it originally was a male military academy. But then they started out, okay, some rights act says you have to pick women, they did. Because women are uh, American citizens and they can serve in these military academies too. Oh, it's a military academy. Yeah. I, but by, I, I, by, I, I by the 1960s, A and M was less of a military academy, more of a regular university. They still would hardly ever admit women. Yeah. They get military academies. You know, women can serve in the military. That's part of what they said is um, women uh, can serve in the military in equal positions. Uh, any position a man can do, uh, women should, should have the opportunity to do so as well. Women would be discharged if they got pregnant in serving the military. Today that's not an issue, but until the 1970s it was. Um, and there are a lot of women in service today. They have, they're doing a lot of different jobs. Uh, they have a lot of talent. Um, they're physically and mentally able to do these jobs as well as anyone else. Um, maybe better than some men in a lot of cases. Um, they're serving our country and defending it proudly. They'd be in a rough spot if they weren't there doing that job. It's all these jobs women doing in the military. I couldn't do it. But that's the idea behind the Equal Rights Amendment. No discrimination basis of sex. None, none of these restrictions. Um, 
But um, by the mid-1970s, there's this massive backlash against the women's movement um, and against the civil rights movement. And so uh, the Equal Rights Movement came like three states uh, short of a ratification. See, in the enabling legislation sending this uh, amendment out to the states, Congress said uh, it'll take set, uh, co uh, states have seven years to ratify this. So they kind of remember that uh, congressional pay bill kind of floating out there at this point. But uh, by 1979, it's still just three states short, 35 out of the 38. Yeah, they have to try to extend a little further. Uh, so Congress passed a law saying we're extending the deadline to 1981 to do that. Well, starting in the 1990s, a group of women activists tried to revive this, and uh, they got three more states to ratify it. You know, it's after the 1981 deadline. And they're trying to get Congress to pass a law saying, you know what, we're taking away the uh, deadline on this and making this an amendment anyway. So it has two-thirds of the, uh, um, both houses of Congress approved it, three-quarters of the states have approved it, so that's kind of an illegal limit. Oh, it's, not, it's not actually an amendment. It was not ratified. It's just kind of legal limbo because of that piece of legislation Congress attached. It wasn't part of the warning amendment itself. But because there's a law attached to it, enabling legislation, that's why they could change the deadlines on it without having to re vote on everything. So that's what these civil rights is that activists are saying is take away this uh, legislation that had put this uh, time limit on it, and the legal hurdles are cleared, and we can ratify the, the ERA. And that was a huge campaign in the 1970s, uh, ERA now. And on the last of the major uh, civil rights acts were the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1991. I make sure that uh, everyone, regardless of physical ability, would have access to uh, right to access uh, public buildings and education and so forth. And so, it transformed the workplace in many ways, uh, uh, making it more ergonomically friendly, uh, making sure that uh, people who were in wheelchairs or who couldn't walk uh, or even quadriplegic could. Uh, um, do these jobs. And it's also when uh, wheelchair ramps start becoming more common for a lot of public buildings. Make sure you know they can't climb the stairs, you know, put a little ramp up so they can come up in their wheelchair. School buildings, they have three or more stories. They are required to have an elevator in them. Um, schools are required to uh, Make sure that students, if they have any kind of learning disability, that their uh, their needs are met. They can meet. They can uh, complete the classes without any problem. And so it didn't make much of an impact at first, but it more and more had this kind of snowball effect, where uh, more people with different abilities um, are able to different physical abilities are able to do these jobs and uh, have more access to public buildings and jobs and schools and everything, education and everything else. It all comes down to the idea of just make sure that everyone has the right to be uh, same rights and same opportunities as everyone else. Because the idea is people don't normally have the same opportunities, but they should have the same rights, and at least we should leave the door open for others. Always treat them with respect, give someone a chance to show what they've got. That's what it's about. That's what America's about. All right, so we'll go ahead and stop there.